have some PTA hour overlapping. Yeah, from 9 to 1. Um, Are you interested? Yeah, I, I respond. I responded to him yeah, one day. I available between um, 8 to not 9 to 10 30. So. So did you finish your class today, uh, yesterday, the next session? Yes. Um, it's really um, like a physically, uh, like a, yeah, <laughs> tired, isn't it? Physically, it's like some like. demanding physical strength. Yeah, yeah. Just the standing, it's hard. Yeah, the right? standing is hard. Like, like, nine to two, one. Oh, oh. Nine yesterday. Nine to two, basically, two to fifty. Okay. So it's like three hours and three minutes. It's really hard. I think it, it should have been uh, two hours. Two hours? Yes. <laughs> but uh, it should have been, but it's quite hard to uh, stand though, all the time. The first left session, I almost to feel it's just different. <laughs> After yeah. finishing left session, I just we got, oh. so, we got so tired, we got so right. exhausted. Okay. But have not done yet, so still have need more time to finish first first uh, left session. So we have the like uh, the things. The first uh, first lab session means means three classes. Uh, three classes. We need one more yeah. next week, right? Yeah, I think you have lab two more, right? Lab two? You have lab class tomorrow. Ah, uh, tomorrow, right? Tomorrow. Six people. Six people. Yeah. Yeah.
Okay, so we start with this lecture. Uh, today we'll be talking about the cleaning and the diffusion process. Cleaning is just like um, almost everyone of you has done the lab. Uh, and diffusion we have not discussed before, but part of the diffusion process we talked about in oxidation, if you remember. We'll be talking about the diffusion today and cleaning process. I see there is a homework number three for you people. That is due by the next week. So that is regarding the cleaning process. So today we'll discuss about the cleaning and you can figure out the answers of these questions. So in cleaning, the first rule, that is AAA rule as I told you in the lab, that you always add acid. Always add acid is a very important rule for the cleaning process. Whenever you have, um, you need to prepare a solution for cleaning, and you have one of that is acid, you always add acid. So acid always goes at the end of the process. So keep in mind that you never add something to the acid, but always add acid to the other chemicals. Okay, so there are actually two steps of cleaning, cleaning process. One is named as FEOL, that is front end of line cleaning process. And the other one is named as back end of line cleaning, that is uh, the front end of line and back end of line. As the name illustrates to a certain extent, that the front end of line means that starting from the silicon wafer to the process where the first metallic deposition comes into account. When you deposit the first metallic layer, when you make up the first electrical connections or first um, maybe a bonding wire or a metallic deposition. So before depositing the metallic layer on your device, the cleaning from the beginning to that step includes into the front end of line. And after the metallic deposition, the back end of line cleaning process starts actually. Okay, so it means that what we have, uh, the cleaning process that we have done in the lab, that was front end of line process or the back end of line process? Sorry? So that was, more, uh, of course, front end of line because that we started with the silicon wafer and we did not have any metallic layer on the surface of the silicon wafer. So that's why we were able to use high reactive acids as well, high reactive alkalis as well, or because we did not have any metallic layer on the surface of the silicon wafer. But in, so in, in the front end of line, we use high reactive acids as well, just like prana clean. Prana clean cannot be used in the back end of line process because that contains sulfuric acid and if you have any metallic layer on the surface, sulfuric acid will actually get it dissolved. So that's why you need to be careful after you start the back end of the cleaning process, after you deposit metallic layer, then you cannot use RCA process that we do uh, use in case of a silicon wafer. Then you need to be careful that now we have the metallic layer, so we cannot use high reactive uh, acids, um, the prana clean or the NH4H or even HF cleanup process. The, you know about the cleanup process uh, that is actually the front end of line that we discuss in the lab. So I'm not going to talk about that front end of line process. So the back end of line process, in this case, you can see that low reactivity solvents are used. Why low reactivity? Because I know that metals, metal has been deposited on the silico silicon wafer, so I don't want my metal to get reacted with any of the high reactivity acid or base or something else. So low reactivity solvent. One of the most commonly used solvent is actually N-methyl pyrolidone that is named as NMP. That is most commonly used solvent in BEOL. Secondly, um, uh, these solvents, they, those are actually low reactive solvents. They are not, the containers are not made of uh, uh, that um, polyethylene plastic bottles that we usually see in the lab for the containers for the chemicals. For these low reactive solvents, we should have either the quartz or uh, the stainless steel containers for the low reactive solvents. Th that's why it makes 
these solvents to be more cost effective, I mean more costly as compared to the front end of line cleanup process. And secondly, so high, it makes highly expensive. And um, here we, ha we also talk about that uh, in cleanup process, if we add some oxidizing agent or some highly reactive agent like oxygen or fluorine, the presence of oxygen fluorine also affects our cleaning um, rate actually. The, fast, the faster it cleans, or we'll uh, talk about later where we'll, uh, when we'll be talking about the dry etching process in the etch process, then you will come to know what is the effect of adding oxygen or what is the effect of adding fluorine to any chemical composition and how it will be affecting the etching process. Because cleaning is actually, you can say, a very slow rate etching. Cleaning is just like that that you actually etch the surface, uh, specifically the oxide cleaner process, that is actually, if you etch silicon dioxide, that is the same process. You go for buffered um, hydrofluoric acid, BHF. And uh, in the last step, that uh, mostly uh, the cleaning is actually just like you um, submerge your wafer in a board or in something in a solution, uh, that's known as a wet ke uh, chemical um, cleaning process, but that has also been replaced by some other technique named as the vapor phase cleaning. In that case, actually, because you are spraying uh, the um, chemical on the wafer surface, so you are actually consuming less amount of uh, your chemical, so that makes uh, it a more co uh, cost effective. So, this is the replace uh, this new technique is actually replacing the previous process. One example of back end of line uh, cleanup process that is a solvent clean. So in solvent cleanup what we do that first of all we um, clean it in acetone then in IPA or um, that is isopropyl alcohol or maybe methanol it, or even you can use all three of them as well. Then we rinse in DI water then dry with nitrogen so it removes the organics. If somebody out of you has been working with uh, mm, a functionalizing the sur um, surface, means you are working with maybe DNA or RNA or some other things like that. So in that case, you have observed that for cleaning process, you follow this uh, protocol. You always go for, you spray acetone, then you spray IP and then DA water. So mostly you repeat this process two to three times so that you make sure that the surface is clean and you have not damaged anything. So they are not, they are not very high reactive chemicals that we are using. It's just an example of organic cleanup in back end of line process. Okay, as I uh, discussed in the lab as well that uh, regarding the prana clean, that prana clean is mostly used for removing the photoresist residues, if you remember. The photosis, the strips of photosis that needs to be cleaned, this is one of the very critical step when you are cleaning, you need to make sure that there is no photosis residues because when you are fabricating a device, it may happen that you are um, spinning the photosis, you are patterning your film and again you need to pattern another layer of uh, some other material. So you spin the photosis again and it may happen again and again. So that's why you need to make sure that before you deposit the next layer, you clean the surface and there's no photosis residues from the previous photolithographic process. So photosis residues needs to be removed. When photosis residues needs to be taken into consideration after the etching process. So uh, you know that whenever you etch some surface, it means that you are actually patterning the surface because a uh, photolithography plus etching is actually one way of patterning a uh, thin layer. You know, do you know what the um, lift off process or no? Lift off process, what is the lift off? I guess because I was talking about the etching, so I believe when you know about photolithography and etching, you should know about the lift off as well. When I say that photolithography, plus etching. 
the lift of maybe photo resist was deposited. It actually helps you pattern any thin layer, right? If you want to pattern a thin layer, you will have to do photolithography and then you go for etching process. So the air, by using a photolithography, the exposed area would be etched away and the protected area that is protected by the photoresist that would not be etched. So any thin layer can be patterned by using photolithography plus etching. At the same time, the same patterning can be done the other way that is named as lift off. I believe when you will be talking about photolithography, Dr. Bal will discuss in detail what is lift off. But here, just to let you know that photolithography plus etching can do the same job what can be done by lift off process. So, this process has its own benefits, and lift off process has its own drawbacks. For example, lift off process can be done only for the metallic layers. If I need to pattern a metallic layer, I can do either of these two choices. But if I want to pattern an elastic layer, any elastic layer or polymeric layer or that has that is not metallic, in that case, this lift off process cannot be used. Okay, I, um, anybody who knows what is a lift off, because until unless you don't know lift off, you won't understand. Why it cannot be used with elastic layers? I think in lift up at first, uh, photo is deposited, then is etched, and uh, then the metal layer is deposited. Yes, he is very right actually. That in lift up process, before the deposition of the thin metallic layer, you spin on photoresist. You pattern a photoresist, and then you deposit the um, metallic layer that you want to pattern. And when you remove the photoresist. In this way, this is silicon vapor. So, let's suppose that this is the photoresist. I put the photoresist, I pattern it. Okay? I spun in photoresist, do the photolithography, open this area. So, this is the photoresist. Now, I deposit the thin layer. Layer of, of metallic layer. It should be metallic in case of lift off. Okay? In this way, when I remove the photoresist, so photoresist is removed, it will lift off whatever it deposited on the top of photoresist. So that's why we call it as lift off process. Because it will photoresist would be removed. At the same time, the metal at the top of the photosis would be moved. So we have only thin metallic layer at the middle. So this is a lift of process. This same thing can be done by photolithography as well. That is, if I have silicon paper, so in photolithography, first of all, you need to have the thin layer that needs to be patterned. In this case, you have photoresist and then you go for the thin layer. In this case, you have thin layer, then you want to, because you need to do etching in this case. Now I need to pattern it. So what I'll do, that I will expose these areas that I need to remove. Okay, this is my photoresist. So then I do for, go for etching. Etching will remove the thin layer that is exposed. And at the end, I remove my photoresist. So the same pattern can be achieved in both ways. So just uh, because I was talking about the photolithography and etching, so keep in mind that lift off can also be used. Yes. Uh, is there a different solvent you use to remove the uh, photoresist in case of lift off? Sorry. Uh, is the solvent different for uh, removing the photoresist? No. No. Then how come the metal goes away in uh, what's on top of the resistor not on? That's why I say that there are some limitations. First of all, the thickness of the photoresist should be more than the thickness of the thin film. So if this much thick layer is removed by acetone, that removing the photoresist and developing, that is different thing, you know this thing, okay? Removing the photoresist, we usually use acetone to remove the photoresist. 
and developing means that only the sensitized photoresist uh, would be actually removed by that developer. So in this case, you should be, if you have a thick layer of um, photoresist as compared to the aluminum or anything on the top of that, it should be metal. So when this is removed, it cannot stay in air, so it will also be removed. So because it's not actually a way, uh, um, it, if the, it means that the limitation is that the metallic layer that can be uh, patterned in this case will be very thin only. If it's going to be thick enough, in that case it will become a blackened type uh, deposition, so then even the removal of photoresist will not lift the uh, thick layer of metallic layer up actually. So that's why if it's thin, so it means there would be actually a breakage or not a strong bonding between the pattern that we want and the pattern that we remove. So if there is a height difference, this layer, they are not connected, so that would be removed. Uh, so only the, uh, uh, there's a difference in the masking, otherwise... Yeah, there's, no there's a difference in the masking. So, but the problem is that, I, as I told you, uh, it has its own benefits, it has its own benefits. In this case, you don't need to match the etchant. You don't need to think about, okay, I want to remove this thin metallic layer, which etchant I should use. You don't need to think about that because you know whatever the metal is that would be lifted off. But it has limitations only a thin layer and secondly, only metallic layers. So. It's not a um, topic of discussion for today, but you will discuss in detail later on. Okay, but you know that in this case, whenever we do etching, etching is always done after photolithography. That's what I was trying to uh, tell you guys. So after etching process, you need to make sure that there is no photoresist residues. Similarly, whenever you want to um, implant um, the dopant actually, in that case, you use photoresist at, as the mask of to that dopant implantation. So, because again, you are using the photoresist so after the implanting process. That is the, uh, that is also used for ion implantation. That is also used for the diffusion. That is a part of that is a way how we diffuse the dopant. So, photoresist is used as an implant mask as well. So, once you are done with that, you need to make sure that implant mask is removed. Thirdly that uh, after post break you whenever you develop your uh, photoresist you always before uh, after developing you always post break just to make sure that photoresist gets hardened it's not etched away due to the etching so after that step you also um, concerned that if there are any residues and the last step is actually the misaligned mask yes, yes. misaligned mask means that you need to rework on your wafer that you, uh, because if you are working on a device and you, you need to use more than one mask for that device, so you know that each layer of the mask they need to be aligned with each other and we use different types of alignment markers. Do you know this thing? That uh, and different types of alignment markers that may be... It's an alignment marker. It may be a square, but you know as compared to a square, it gives you a better control of the alignment because if you exactly know that the next one, next layer alignment marker comes in here, so it means that uh, you are controlling on all directions, in all directions. Okay, so this type of alignment markers are put on the uh, on the mask actually when you know that more than one layers of photolithographic process will be done in order to complete your device. So if you could not align the um, photolithographic process uh, properly if there was misalignment. So it means that the next photolithographic process, you could not pattern it the way you wanted. So you want to rework this process. So it means due to the misalignment of the mask, you need to remove all the photoresist. So again, you need to make sure that, that, that photoresist strips are not there and you need to remove it. So these are different cases where you need to remove the photoresist. And one more thing that uh, when you are uh, dealing with more than one photolithographic process in that case, while working on the second level or third level, you always keep in mind that you don't damage the uh, underlying levels, means the first step or the second step process. 
because you need to be very careful while etching or while patterning the device that whatever the etchant you are using it does not actually it is not uh, sensitive towards the surface that I have underneath so that you don't uh, damage or you don't destroy the first, first layer of the process so that's why um, you always keep in mind while working with more than one photolithography process on your device that the underlying um, layers um, they are actually not sensitive to the steps or the etching process that you are using for the um, your specific desired layer. Number of photolithography cycles that can be typically done on one wafer ranges from 10 to 25 but I don't think so that uh, usually you need that many number of cycles. What does it mean? I mean, it's not okay, it, it means that uh, uh, as I told you that we can on one wafer uh, if you have pattern uh, one thing you can again sp spun on photosynthesis and go for the second cycle and uh, you pattern that film and you can go for the third cycle so on the same silicon wafer again and again spinning photosynthesis and um, spin photosynthesis develop it that is actually one cycle and that means on the same layer yeah on, on the same uh, substrate same, same substrate yes on the same substrate you cannot uh, do it uh, unlimited more times more so but you can do it 10 to 25 times Okay, and the last line says that what the cycle is. Cycle means that spinning on photosis, and after that you develop it, means removal of photosis. Okay, so there are different types of uh, photosis removal. First is the oxidizing type. In this case, um, uh, commonly named uh, piranha solution, different ratios of this sulfuric acid and H2O2 is here H2O2 is actually the oxidizing agent that is it, it oxidizes the carbon in that uh, photosis to form carbon dioxide and that escapes and that's why it's more easy to uh, remove the photosis if there is any photosis residues but as I told you before that piranha solution cannot be used as an organic cleanup or the photosis uh, residual removal when you have a metallic layer. So it can only be used in case of front end of line cleaning process, not in the back end of line cleaning process. Once you have a metal on the surface, you cannot use this prana clean because it will um, damage your metallic layer. In the lab, we use 3 ratio 1, if you remember, for this prana clean. Uh, but mostly use, uh, I mean, some people use 7 ratio 3 as well. That uh, H2SO4 is 7 and H2O2 is 3 so that's why I say different ratios are used for prana clean but even 1 ratio 1 is used that's also good enough maybe you will have to heat it up 3 ratio 1 is very hot um, and 1 ratio 1 would not be it but you will have to heat it up to 95 to 100 degrees centigrade before and it, and cleaning also it also takes time to cool down Yes, it always takes time on approximately 45 minutes, depending upon what is the concentration you use and what is the volume that is having. So depending upon your volume, the volume that we use in the lab that it took approximately 45 minutes to cool down to any level. Okay, organic strippers. Uh, previously, there is phenol is uh, one of the chemicals, uh, phenol-based chemicals were also used to remove that strippers, but uh, lately that has been removed because the phenol uh, disposal the phenol disposal was very costly process actually you know that every chemical need to be disposed through s certain specific methods we are not concerned with that we just need to make sure that we are putting the disposal in the properly labeled um, containers that says that this is the these are the um, uh, these are the chemicals that contain in that disposal and this is the ratio of the chemicals that are in that disposal. After that, EHA, uh, EHA, uh, ENH department, uh, environment and health uh, department, they actually come in and they dispose it depending upon what chemicals are in. They have their own protocol to dispose that. So phenol based um, solution was having the problem with its disposal process was very costly. So it was replaced lately by N-methyl Pyrrolidone. It also works well and it can also be uh, used to remove the organic strippers including the photosis residues. Dry etching. 
dry etching is actually that uh, uh, you, uh, because whatever we have used up till now, that is the wet etching. Whenever you have a chemical and you dip your wafer inside to clean the surface, so that is a wet, chem wet chemical etching or a wet cleaning process. So dry etching is also used for the cleaning of the wafer surface. In that case, we use an oxygen plasma. Um, that is in the uh, oxygen is in ionized form, so that is used to actually etch the very thin layer of the wafer surface. So we name it as a dry etching. When we'll be discussing in etching process, then you'll come to know what are the benefits of wet etching and dry etching, and what are the drawbacks. They have their own limitations and benefits over one another. But right now, dry etching is also one of the process to clean the surface. And in that case, oxygen plasma is actually uh, very, uh, very energetic, energetic oxygen ions. They st strike the surface and they remove the very thin layer on the top. But of course, as the process says, it can damage your surface as well. The surface of the wafer can be damaged. So I have a question. So uh, for specific uh, photoresistor, we can use any of method or Okay, um, not for specific photoresist. Um, it depends upon your application. As I told you, that dry etching cannot be used in everywhere. But maybe depending upon uh, your, if you have got high aspect ratio, in the and you want to etch it, and you want to be it uh, like this. If I want to etch something, and I want a pattern with the sharp edges, so this etching cannot be done with wet etching. I will have to go for dry etching. So dep it depends upon your application. Then you go for what process of etching you need to use. Okay, so uh, in this case, uh, uh, dry etching because it's actually the gas. It has more access to the deeper trenches. So it, it uh, and secondly, um, the um, wet etching mostly that is isotropic. Isotropic means that it etches vertically and laterally with the same uh, etch rate. But dry etching uh, etches in one direction. So even wet etching can be an isotropic. But when you will be discussing about etching, it will you will come to know about that. Okay, so um, we are talking about that dry etching. As I told you, that oxygen or fluorine can be introduced as a reactive um, species when we are doing the dry etching. What is the effect of oxygen and fluorine? Um, they can uh, they can increase the etching process. How they increases, and that's why um, you need to know about H by C ratio, uh, F by C ratio. Right now, I am not going to talk about that, but you should know that adding fluorine or oxygen, they actually affect your etch rate in dry etching. Do they act as a catalyst? Uh, yes. They, uh, that's why I say that the important thing is actually F by C ratio. Adding fluorine, increase F by C ratio. Adding oxygen, decrease F by C ratio. So this is the factor that actually uh, is affected. So uh, when you will be talking about dry etching, you should know about what the F by C ratio, um, how it actually affects, and how, and, and you will see that F by C ratio works differently for silicon and silicon dioxide. So we uh, because this is all about the dry etching process, and today we are talking about the cleaning, not the dry etching. So I don't want to get into details. But when you will be talking about dry etching, you should. Um, put up the question about F by C. Okay, so as we um, as I already have taught that um, the plasma can damage the surface and the etch rate is high and um, the, when we introduce these uh, agents actually they react with the surface and after that through the vacuum, they are um, uh, removed from that chamber. <coughs> Here again, we are talking about the photosynthesis removal by um, H chemistry, H time, implant energy, and those. So we are talking about the dry etching again. In the dry etching, the time for how much time you are putting your device inside the chamber? The dose means that what is the concentration of your um, 
uh, uh, etch, etch actually the etching agent so what is the concentration or what is the dose of the gas that you are introducing in that chamber what is the implant energy of that means how energetic how fastly they are reacting with the surface and what is the etch chemistry as well because maybe uh, for etching once uh, for etching one material you may have more than two to three gases they are available but one gas reacts fastly than the other so etch rate of every gas is different from the other so that they are the three to four parameters that you need to keep in mind when you are working with the dry etching process the time the concentration the etch rate and the energy or um, Yes, that is the power. So you, you, but you have good controls, and uh, th that is very simple process, dry etching process. You have controls that these are the gases that you want to introduce, and this is the concentration or the power of this gas. Um, even you can use more than one gases, a mixture of two gases, to move any um, surface while dry etching process. Okay, so. Um, because we are basically discussing about the cleanup process, that was just uh, um, dry etching is also one of the process that is used to clean the surface. As I told you, that oxygen plasma is very commonly known process to clean the um, wafer surface. The other um, ways how we can clean the surface, they are named as vibrational um, method. We can use the ultrasonic or the me me megasonic waves. The ultrasonic waves, how we uh, do this thing that uh, in the liquid it may be DI water or it may be the uh, H2O2 um, liquid. So in, in that liquid we produce the high energy sound waves actually. Th those waves, uh, due to those waves what happens that uh, um, because they are the waves, so what happens that bubbles they form and immediately they collapse. So when the bubble collapses, you get a liquid free space or cavity. So when the bubble forms and uh, immediately it actually collapses, no sooner did it collapse, there would be a cavity. Okay, so in this way, in this way, when you have the vibrations. So you form and you collapse the bubbles, named as the cavitation, uh, the cavitation bubble. So that cavitation is actually the process that makes the surface of the wafer um, clean. What we do that uh, we don't touch the surface. Keep in mind that liquid is there. In this case, we don't have any brush or in we don't have anything that actually touches the that is in contact with the surface of the wafer. But just the surf, uh, the wafer is. Inside a liquid, uh, it may be DA water, it may be H2O2 or any other liquid. Um, in, in that liquid, we produce those um, sound waves, and due to those sound waves, the cavitation effect comes into account, and the surface of the wafer, uh, the particles on the uh, surface of the wafer, they actually got displaced, and because it is moving, so it can clean the uh, wafer surface. But you know this thing that uh, due to this cavitational shock, because it, it's just like a shock, because it clasps suddenly, so it's, it works like a shock. Due to this cavitation shock, the wafer surface can be damaged as well. So just to avoid this cavitation shock, what we do, that we go to higher frequencies. We go to megasonic frequencies. At high frequencies, at high frequencies we are not providing enough time for the bubble to get collapsed. So the bubble does not get enough time to get collapsed because the frequency is high. So that's why those shocks do not come into account and we can avoid those. But the rest of the process is the same, that the liquid that is used, that may be DA water, that may be um, SC1 or SC2, they are actually the standard um, cleanup process, one standard cleanup process too. Then they are the parts of RCA process. So it may means it may be any chemical solution, the liquid, and after that you uh, give some high in a, uh, high waves than the ultrasonic waves, named as the megasonic. So, question: so Can you specify what particle is it? So, like, uh, uh, what particles it removes actually? Right. Uh, it removes actually the dust particles, or it may be any. 
uh, traces of some thin films on the surface. Um, but if you have some, um, even if you have some metallic ions on the surface, uh, but not heavy metals, if you have some metallic ions, that can also be removed. So anything, any particles on the surface, that mostly it's the dust particles that are introduced due to the process steps, or it may be the traces of the thin layers that uh, if you have a thin layer pattern and it breaks at some point, after breaking the thin layer, it may be deposited on the surface. It may st yeah, get stick on the surface. Bombarding, bombardment, right? Due to any damage, that because the thin layer can, if you have pattern thin layer, if you have this paper, let's suppose I'm talking about the top view. It's a thin layer, a U-shaped thin layer. So maybe it breaks at here. So this part is broken, and that broken part may stay on the surface. So that's good name as the uh, remaining traces of the thin layer. That is the um, parts of the thin layer that. Um, are introduced on the surface due to breaking of the thin layer. So that are removed actually. Okay, after vibrational uh, process, there is um, one other process named as the uh, scrubber. So in this case, water or any other liquid that is supplied to the wafer surface and there are brushes that are made of PVA, that is polyvinyl alcohol. Um, that uh, PVA brushes are used to push the wa uh, water or the other liquid along the surface of the wafer. So, uh, in, uh, in this case, again, keep in mind that the, uh, uh, though the name looks like scrubber means it scrubs the surface, but it does not. It, it's again, it does not in contact it does not contact the surface of the wafer. The brush does not contact the surface, but it uh, it's very close to the surface and it um, exerts some pressure by the liquid between the brush and the surface. So it's just the pressure, uh, it, it's just introducing some pressure and it, it also causes the movement of the um, liquid along the wafer surface from one point to the other. But it's not contacting the surface, that is the one point that I want to keep you guys to keep in mind. CMP again? Sorry? CMP. CMP. Oh, CMP. CMP is actually chemical mechanical polishing. We call it as chemical mechanical polishing or chemical mechanical cleanerization. At the end of the uh, fabrication process, you go for CMP. That is the, at last, you go for CMP. So metallization and CMP, they always come at the end of a process. If you remember last time, the, in, uh, the slides we were talking about, in that case, there was a step CMP. The chemical, mechanical portion, when we deposit in the, uh, in the trenches, when we deposit oxide, and after that we do chemical, mechanical planarization, so we remove that oxide layer. Remember? That is a shallow trench. Uh, oxidation. In this shallow trench oxidation, we talked about CMP. Okay, so uh, why we use PVA? PVA because uh, they are very um, soft and elastic material and uh, they are good to exert some pressure and they have some flexibility as well. So that's why PVA has been considered as a good material for um, uh, making those brushes along the surface of the liquid. Wafer rinsing and drying. So you know, always after cleaning, we um, go for uh, rinsing the wafer in DA water, and then we blow it dry with nitrogen. So for us, why we rinse the wafer uh, in DA water? Because after that particular chemical has done its job, we want that um, chemicals to be removed from the wafer surface. We don't want that chemical to be on the surface, so that's why we uh, rinse it in DA water. So DA water is deionized water, very um, high resistant water, so that does not have any contamination, so that removes 
that chemical uh, for example after prana uh, clean up if you uh, rinse it in da water so any sulfuric acid or hydrogen peroxide chemical that was on the wafer surface that is removed due to this uh, rinsing process there are different ways how the rinsing can be done first of all one is named as overflow rinse in this case what happens that uh, you have a tank of da water and you put your wafers loaded in just like we did in the lab but that is not actually the designated tank we use beaker as a tank of da water but in the fabs you have the tanks of da water at the bottom the water actually keeps on uh, going out of the chamber uh, and on the top the water comes in so in that case why we do so because we don't want those uh, contaminations moved by the DA water after in the rinsing process to get stick with the um, wafer again if they stay in the DA water. So that's why in that as the name shows overflow rinse that we have the chamber we dip the wafers in and after that that DA water is overflowing so the new water is coming in and uh, from the bottom of the chamber the water is going out. In, in order to inc uh, increase the flow process or make it more directional we um, mostly use the nitrogen nitrogen bubbles are introduced um, from the bottom so in that case uh, it makes the process mm, better so we can introduce the nitrogen that as well the second process is dump rinse this is also uh, very similar to um, the overflow rinse process with a mm, minute difference First of all, that you don't fill up the chamber, um, you don't fill up the ch uh, chamber of the DA water before you put your wafers. What you do that you put your wafer and you start spraying DA water um, from the top on the on the surface of uh, uh, silicon wafer. So you start spraying at the same time you start uh, introducing DA water from the bottom of that um, chamber actually of that. Um, um, what I would say that enclosed part where we are actually having our DM, um, sorry the wafers so why we call it as dump prints at name sh shows that the bottom of that chamber that is actually a fake bottom because at <coughs> when it actually fills up when it actually fills up that bottom uh, is removed and all the water dumps is dumped to the uh, drainage process and again it starts putting up new water and so it's uh, it's different from the overflow rinse in the way that we spray and after that uh, it's not continuously getting out it's dumped at one time when it's uh, filled in the bottom is removed and the water is dumped and then again bottom comes in and again the process starts so we can repeat so this process what will be done on lab that is dump rinse Sorry? What we did it in the lab? That is oh, no, no, we did not mm, did the. No, no we just clean with GI water. So what uh, actually, what we did in the lab, um, that was because the, these are the rinse dedicated process, they are in the fab. We don't have in the fab that thing. So we rinse it manually actually. So that's why. Uh, if you remember that after taking it out from that DA water, okay. we I uh, asked you guys to rinse it in the DA water manually yeah. because we need the fresh DA water to clean the surface. Be, um, <coughs> after one uh, um, chemical process, the cleaning process, when you put it in DA water, some of the contamination would still uh, be inside that DA water. So that's why we need to um, um, put up or flow the new. Um, DA water on the surface of the wafer. So we are doing none of this. Process. Yeah, we are doing. But I just want to let you know uh, mo uh, that what are the different processes. The third thing is uh, various spray rinse configuration. This is also done. It's not. Um, this is what usually is done in the clean room at universities as well. But in our university, we don't have it. That is, in uh, in order to dry um, rinse the wafer and blow it dry with nitrogen you don't do it manually you have the dryer 
and uh, they are, that are actually the spin winds dryer. So you put the wafer inside, the DA water is sprayed on the wafer surface, and at that time it's rotating as well. And after that, hot nitrogen is actually actually blown on the surface, and at the same time it's rotating at high speed. So due to the rotation, the water splits up, so it makes the process even more fast. So that is more safe because you are not holding it with hand. You are and uh, more safe and more cost effective as well because you are actually um, spraying the spraying the DA water on the surface and more efficient. But we don't have that. Uh, we call it as uh, spin rinse dryer SRD, I guess something like that. So spin rinse dryer, we don't have it here. But I have been working at UTD Clean Room, so they have those spin uh, rinse dryers. Okay. So for the drying process, the first thing is again spin dryers that I talked about. That, that is safe and cost effective and it uh, needs ionized nitrogen flow into drying chamber to reduce charging. Why we need ionized nitrogen gas while drying it? Okay, so when it actually rotates, when it actually rotates at high speed um, and nitrogen is blown on the surface, after that when you take it out, because that is the hot nitrogen, when you take it out of uh, that chamber and you expose it to the atmosphere, it, it's very um, and it's very likely to get reaction with the uh, air because it has got the charge. So it can attract the particles. It has got it gets charge on its surface. So that's why so that it does not get charged. Later on, uh, the scientists introduce the ionized nitrogen while um, rinsing it in that uh, spin dryer. So ionized gas actually uh, restricts the vapor to get charged. Uh, if you are not using the ionized nitrogen gas, in that case when you take it out, it will be charged and the charged surface always attracts the particles towards its surface. So to um, block that charge, we use the ionized nitrogen gas. Okay, so second is IPA vapor dry. In this case, what happens that uh, um, uh, what we do that uh, when you have your wafer in DA water, the wafer is still wet and you put it inside an environment that is filled with IPA, isopropyl alcohol in vapor phase. Okay, so what happens that, uh, and that is also at uh, approximately 80 degrees centigrade, I believe that IPA and at that temperature what happens that uh, there is an IPA coating on the surface so water is replaced by IPA in that environment when you have the wet wafer uh, inside IPA in vapor phase so IPA gets on the surface and water is removed then you take that IPA coated wafer outside so you know that IPA is actually uh, an organic solvent so that is very volatile that evaporates very fastly. So when you take out the IP coated wafer, it evaporates very fastly. So that is all other, another way to um, get the wafer dry. And uh, when you take it out, it evaporates very fastly. At the same time, you blow the nitrogen on the surface as well. So that um, you make sure that there is no water residue on the surface. The last drying process is named as Mayagonin dry. He was a um, scientist who actually developed this process. What he did that if you have a, um, the wafer that is inside the DA water and you want to uh, get it dry. So if you pull the wafer at a very slow speed at 1 to 2 millimeter per second, only 1 to 2 millimeter per second. So in and um, the wafer, uh, the uh, the wafer was inside, the wafer was inside the DA water, and the outer environment was IPA plus nitrogen. The outer environment was IPA. The chamber, the ambient uh, environment was IPA plus uh, nitrogen. So what happens that when you take it very slow, the meniscus between the IPA environment and the water. You know, there should be, because when it's taking out, there should always be a meniscus between the IPA and the water. 
So at that many case, the IPA uh, gets uh, absorbed at very thin layer. So there is a gradient um, between the IPA concentration at that meniscus and in the surface of the water. So due to that, due to that IPA, um, due to that gradient, there is actually surface tension gradient, and due, uh, because there is a gradient, when you pull the wafer outside, the water actually. Uh, pulls the water towards its bulk volume instead of letting it go with the wafer. So uh, that is, uh, he was actually, uh, mm, I think so, an intelligent scientist. So he gave this idea. So uh, due to uh, his name was Maragit, so uh, Maragoni. So it w this process was named on his name. So it's also, though it's an um, time consuming because it's slow, you need to take it very slowly. Uh, but it gives you another way to get your wafer dry. So due to that gradient of the surface tension, because IPA is at higher concentration at the top and lower concentration at the bottom, so that's why the water uh, pulls the water towards its volume and does not let the water go with the wafer surface. Watermarks, as I told you that, uh, uh, if you remember that when you were taking your wafer out of that quartz board. It was not, if you blow it dry, it was not at all very clean. The surface was not clean. You were supposed to rinse it dry in clean DA water. So that's why if the water is automatically um, uh, dried on the surface of the wafer, so you get the water marks on the surface. And that is also one of the contamination. So you don't want the water marks. You need to be careful that water marks are never there. Watermarks can be there due to um, many reasons, but the exact reason why the watermarks are there, that um, uh, has not been completely understood what is the phenomena behind. But some um, people say that it's due to there may be some pits on the surface and water actually stays in there. And some says that water actually uh, etches away uh, that part where it stays. So. But watermarks uh, is one of the contamination, and you always consider that there should be no watermark uh, if you want your wafer to be considered as a clean surface. Wafer drying, I believe that we have talked about this thing. Spin rinse dryer, on the left side you can see that it spins. And this is what Maragoni dryer I was talking you about, that hair, IPA and water, so there should always be there should always be an interface between IP environment and the water. And at this interface, IP concentration is more. So that's why there comes in a stress, uh, um, a surface tension. So due to that, the water always tries to pull the water um, towards its bulk volume. And the wafer that is getting out at very high speed, that does not have any kind of uh, water on it. Okay, so contact angle and wetting behavior. Contact angle is, uh, do you know about the contact angle? Did you hear about that? The contact angle? Well, why we use the contact angle usually in research? Why do we need the contact angle? Adhesion. It's really with adhesion. Okay. So whenever, so whenever you need to make sure or you want to check it out in the research, you don't know that maybe I'm depositing some polymer. I deposit the polymer and after that I want to check it out whether this polymer is hydrophilic or hydrophobic. So in order to confirm the hydrophobicity or hydrophilicity of the surface or of any material, you go for the contact angle measurement. So contact angle measurement tells you about the hydrophobic nature or the hydrophilic nature. So as you can see that in case of uh, in A, the hydrophobic nature, the angle theta, that should be greater than 90. Why is, is it should be so? Because if I have a surface, if I have a surface and um, I get any polymer deposited on the surface of the wafer. This is a polymer. If this polymer is hydrophobic, for example, and there is a drop of water, 
so drop of water because it's hydrophobic that water does not want to get in contact with the uh, surface it tries to make as less contact with the surface as possible so it tries to contact within itself so it tries to make less contact with the surface so it will make like this if i want to find this angle that the water makes with the surface and this angle is greater than 90 if this angle is greater than 90 means it's actually hydrophobic because it does not want to have greater contact with the surface it tries to get itself away from the surface because in this case the water has tried its best to get itself away from the surface and if the surface were, were a hydrophilic surface in that case the water loves to get in contact with the surface and the same droplet should have formed this, uh, this shape because now it gets in contact with the surface. So what's the re reasons about it? What are the reasons behind to be hydrophobic or hydrophilic uh, water? Uh, Hyd oh, the water is not hydrophilic or hydrophobic. It's the actually nature. the surface. surface. Water is the same. Hydrophilic means that something that um, that has attraction towards water. And hydrophobic means that something that uh, actually hates to get in contact with the water. So, so that's why, uh, you know, if something uh, is hydrophobic, you cannot get it dissolved in water. So it depends on the property of surface. Uh, it, it depends on the property of the material. So hydrophobic or hydrophilic, this is the material property, not the wa water property. But that material property is related to water. Means if something is eager to uh, get in contact with water, so that material is hydrophilic. And if something is not uh, having any infection with water, so it means that is hydrophobic. And in research, we always want to have the hydrophilic surface. Yes. Is it only for water or other liquids as well? Um, anything that contains hydrogen actually. actually. But we always test it with um, water. No, that's why I say that uh, in research work, let's suppose that I want this surface to grow my cells. I want this sur surface to grow a cell. So cells are the living animals. Cells cannot be grown on, on a hydrophobic surface. Secondly, another example I can give you that I have a nanopore, for example. Nanopore, you know that that's a very small hole. And I want to run an experiment. So uh, I coated my nanopore from the internal side with the polymer. In that case, I want that liquid to go through. The liquid may be um, that there should be water uh, containing some salt that is uh, to develop the ionic concentration. So that liquid, that water, if that material is hydrophobic, I will never be able to get that water pass through that pore because um, it would um, throw uh, the water away from itself. It will show always a resistance to the water to pass through because it's very small. It's always it's already having some uh, resistance to get anything to pass through because of very small hole. So I need to make sure that the polymer that I'm depositing on the pore that needs to be hydrophilic in that case, I can use that polymer in my experiment, otherwise I cannot use. Otherwise, you cannot run the experiment because if that uh, polymer is hydrophobic, in that case, it, it, it names as wetting of the pore. Do you know what wetting? So in research, we use this term wetting of the pore. So pore will never be wetted until and unless it has hydrophilic surface. So if it is hydrophobic, you cannot get your pore wet. Get your pore wet means that water can pass through. So it's only affinity to hydrogen, not the oxygen after. Um, hydrophilic and hydrophobic, mostly they are um, uh, considered with respect to water. But you can, I, I exactly don't know that what is the hydrophobic in, uh, interrelated properties, what should hydrophobic. I know, but they love water, they hate water. So. Um, but as the name shows, they should be hydrophobic, means phobic from hydrogen. So that's why I think so. It should be from the uh, love for hydrogen or hate for hydrogen. But you can check it out that what other 
um, alternatives can be used instead of water. But for measuring the contact angle, we always use water. Okay. So particle counter, at the last, in order to make sure that uh, your vapor surface is clean or not clean, we have certain uh, equipment that is used to count your particles on the vapor surface, that how many uh, particles or how many contamination particles are on the surface. For that case, what we do, if we have got an unpatterned vapor surface, uh, we use an optical laser that is striking on the surface at right angle, that is vertically, it strikes the surface. If the surface is very clean, if uh, there is no particle at that point, so actually you scan your wafer. The complete wafer is scanned so with that laser. So whenever there, the, there is no particle at, on the surface, it means that the uh, um, laser will be coming back vertically in the same angle, at 90 angle. So at that right angle, it will come back and it will not be detected by the detector. Whenever there is some particle, a contamination of any type, due to, that, due to that particle, the laser will not be coming back at right angle, it will get reflected. Okay? So when it gets scattered from that particle, it is detected by the uh, detector and says, here is some uh, particle or some contamination, here the wafer is not neat and clean. So you know that the laser diameter that is very small, so you can actually, while scanning, you can actually calculate how many particles are there on the surface. And if you have a pattern wafer, in that case, in pattern wafer means you already have a rough surface. You, you don't have a smooth surface. So when you already have a rough surface, so in that case, the phenomena of vertically hitting with um, the, the vertically hitting with the laser and after that you expect to be it back at right angle that will not work for a rough surface because the rough surface means that it will never come back vertically so even if it's the pattern it's not the contamination but you will feel like that there are particles and uh, contamination all over the surface so you need to go for another technique for the pattern surface or the rough surface in that case, what you need to do, that uh, um, uh, you don't strike the laser at right angle. You strike it at some obliquely, some at some angle, and at that angle, when it uh, strikes that pattern, it comes back, and again, it's uh, received by the detector at some uh, oblique angle, and the the, the after receiving that uh, scattered beam it compares with already known scattered beam that whether it's the pattern or it's some other contaminating particle. So if there was only pattern, how it should be? It already had that known pattern in memory. So when it compares with that, if it's scattering the same way, it means it's not the particle, it's actually the pattern. So you strike it at some angle instead of vertically. So that is the way how we actually um, calculate the number of particles. Okay. So uh, it was uh, something about cleaning. Now we are going to talk about the diffusion. Just like oxidation, diffusion is also one of the very important processes. Actually, there are five basic process in silicon uh, IC fabrication technology. Out of those five, this diffusion, or we call it as ion implantation, actually, we should call it as doping. So doping is one of those five basic processes. Oxidation, doping, etching, photolithography, and metallization. So these are five steps. So oxidation, uh, we have talked about photolithography. I believe um, we'll be discussing later. So doping is also one of the very important parameters because doping actually affects all the other uh, processes in your fabrication. Um, fabricating the device. So doping is done by two techniques, either by diffusion or either by ion implantation. That you bombard the ions and you uh, diffuse your dopant or uh, you actually go for the diffusion process. So these are the two methods how you actually uh, introduce that dopant concentration inside your um, surface or silicon wafer. 
we are not going to talk about ion interface today we'll be talking about diffusion but you should know that that is also that can also be used to introduce the uh, dopant concentration but both of these again should have their own benefits and drawbacks so you should know what is the benefit of diffusion what is the benefit of ion implantation where um, ion implantation is better and where this diffusion is better so because when you when you know the comparison of all the available uh, methods for some process then you can think about that for your device for your project what you are working on which process should be used as i told you that if i know that in my device i have a patterns like this so i will know that okay i need reactive ion etching or dry etching i would not be using an isotropic wet etching and um, similarly uh, um this diffusion and ion implantation they also have their own benefits but i am not going to talk about the comparison because once we talk about ion implantation you will automatically come to know about the comparison in diffusion what we are going to discuss for today first of all the mathematical equation for diffusion that was given by fix uh, if there is fix first equation and fix second equation first law and second law and um, we can uh, find out the solution by applying certain boundary conditions and that solution can be used as an equation to find out uh, the diffusion or the dopant concentration at any uh, depth okay the, that fixed equation uh, the mathematical equation we will talk about two things that is pre deposition and driving pre deposition and driving these will be two things after that we will be talking about defects and dopant diffusion then we will talk about diffusion in polysilicon and silicon dioxide uh, actually these are just the names of the techniques that we will be discussing later on the, then there is some anomalous diffusion effects it means that uh, the fixed equation the equation that we will drive in at some in certain conditions you don't get the right answer so it means that that equation does not work well there are certain uh, other parameters that actually affect the diffusion we call it as uh, anomalies in that um, diffusion process so we will talk about those different anomalies as well diffusion metrology at the last we will talk about that how to find out um, how to measure actually the diffusion the, the diffusion in your surface of the wafer in diffusion metrology the methods that we use first thing you can measure the sheet resistance because greater the dopant greater the sheet resistance or the lesser greater the dopant concentration less resistance less resistance that may that's very obvious so greater the dopant concentration lesser would be the sheet resistance this is what we will be doing in the second experiment in our lab that we will diffuse the wafer in the diffusion furnace and after every 10 to 15 minutes we will find out the sheet resistance and you will see that the sheet resistance goes on decreasing decreasing and decreasing means we are uh, activating more and more and more of the dopant um, atoms so why the name is sheet resistance uh, its name is sheet resistance because sheet resistance is defined as because it's the resistance of a square sheet is defined as the resistance of a if you have a square of one centimeter by one centimeter and you find out what is the resistance of this sheet it should have some thickness as well so uh, that's named as sheet resistance but thickness is very less mm. I believe you know about resistivity as at least. Yeah. Do you know about resistivity? Yes. Defined by rho. This parameter is known. Okay. Then sheet resistance R S is always equal to resistivity by thickness of the thin film. So if you know the resistivity and you divide it by the thickness of that thin film, mm, we are talking about. So you calculate what is the sheet resistance. And uh, other two methods that are used for to find out um, the diffusion value that is actually SRP that is spreading resistance profile, SIMS that is secondary ion uh, mass spectroscopy. So all these topics will be discussed in later on. Introduction to diffusion. Uh, what is the diffusion? As I told you, that uh, the
the movement of the dopant inside your wafer that is actually the diffusion the movement of chemical constituent due to the constituent gradient uh, if you know that in general term uh, in general term what we call diffusion what is uh, diffusion actually in general term yes everything that moves from higher concentration to lower concentration and just like this smell the perfume if i um, um, put some perfume here so through the air it actually diffuses that means the diffusion because it moves from higher concentration to lower concentration so similarly this is what happens that we introduce a higher concentration on the surface and after that it moves from high concentration to low concentration at high temperature so we say that we are activating our uh, diffusing element okay so uh, as i told you that at at high temperatures at high temperature we actually gets our uh, diffusion to get into the um, uh, to get into the wafer more and more as we keep at high temperature for more and more time Okay, uh, the upper limit of that uh, diffusion that can be actually the maximum is the solid solubility of that dopant in that layer. The solid solubility it, you cannot uh, in the upper there is an upper limit you cannot put maximum uh, unlimited dopant in in that uh, specific structure. There is an upper limit and that is actually like for example boron the solid solubility of boron in silicon that is the maximum. dopant of boron that you can introduce in silicon so as the graph show that higher the temperature higher would be the dopant but at the same time it also depends what type of dopant you are using means boron has got a different solid solubility uh, phosphorus has got even more solid solubility than that and aluminum has got very less solid solubility so that's why aluminum cannot cross this limit at 1300 degrees centigrade but you know at this point boron has much higher than that so the solid solubility of that dopant is an important factor okay because uh, we don't have that much time that we'll be discussing um, the mathematics of diffusion but i can just give you a brief idea that uh, in diffusion first of all what you do that you have there are two steps pre deposition and driving in pre deposition what you do that you pre deposition as the name shows that you put your dopant on the surface on the surface you introduce your dopant you can do it in, in any way you put it in any um uh, gaseous environment that contains that particular dopant in that gas or what you can do you can spin on dopant on the surface that is a solid and you can spin on dopant this is what we will be doing we will be doing spin on phosphorus dopant on the surface and this is pre deposition so on the surface on the surface you uh, the surface concentration is always constant in pre deposition the surface concentration is constant uh, it's constant means uh, that uh, depending on the time if this is t1 this is t2 and this is t3 and t3 is greater than t2 is greater than t1 okay so higher the time the greater would be the depth of that but the surface concentration is constant because no sooner because you have unlimited source unlimited source not unlimited surface concentration this is constant not unlimited this is one thing that people make mistake when i say unlimited source it means that when one atom diffuses into the other atom uh, is replaced by that from the source okay so you always have the constant concentration on the surface whenever you move to you put two whenever three are diffused into three are added as well so this is named that this is a pre deposition in pre deposition the surface concentration is constant after you have the surface concentration constant this was the pre deposition yeah uh, you will be discussing this thing in next lecture actually i am just giving you an idea then comes the drive in in drive in what you do just you put your wafer at high temperature 
at high temperature you have constant concentration of the surface and after that it tries to go deeper and deeper and deeper so initially let's suppose you started with this that it was only on the surface you know it was only on the surface this was only the thickness that was having that uh, dopant it was only on the surface after some time in at high temperature it moved up to x2 but the surface concentration surface concentration you can see it it has decreased because now you don't have the source whatever you had that is constant after some more time it goes even deeper so the important thing is here that in every case the area under the curve is always constant because the area under the curve is actually showing the total um number of dopant molecules and that is constant in driving so in driving the area under that curve would always be constant just the matter is that from the surface uh, dopant is moving into that uh, wafer so this is the driving but this will be discussed in detail in the next lecture hopefully dr bal will be here so he'll be taking the next lecture and he'll be um starting from driving and um pre deposition okay so um, that's all for today if you have any question you can ask me nothing okay hope to see half of you tomorrow in the lab again and in the next lecture dr bal will be there uh one thing about the diffusion that i want to mention uh when we say in driving process we activate our dopant so some people don't know what do we mean by activating a dopant because if you have uh, if you introduce a dopant and it's interstitial it's interstitial means that the silicon atom this is silicon and this is silicon it is sharing four oxygen atoms yeah, sorry it is it is sharing by it has four uh, outer shell atoms so it is uh, shared by four other atoms because that is a covalently bonded so if i have so you know it will be covalently bonded on four sides it has four if i have a boron atom here boron has three outer shell atoms if i have it here i have it in the in, in the layer but it's not replaced by one of the silicon so it's not activated it's interstitial it's of no use for me it's of no use at this time because it will be of use to me when it replaces any one of these when it gets replaced by silicon it makes it interstitial it replaces itself by it so it means now there would be it has three atoms so there would be one vacancy available and that vacancy is actually increasing my uh, current capability or decreasing my resistance so activating means making my dopant beneficial for me making my dopant replace by the uh, original atom so that is actually the, you activate high temperature okay so that was just one term because usually people don't know what do we mean by activating your dopant concentration i have a question uh, like in interstitial means uh, it's in the lattice but it's not it's in the gap uh, i mean vacant area yeah it's in the lattice but it's it it, it, it did not replace any silicon it's not, it's uh, outer shell atoms are not uh, shared by the other silicon atoms yeah. in other words you can say that it's of no use it doesn't change the lattice structure ah uh, actually the dopant does when if there is uh, too much a uh, dopant concentration the now when it uh, whenever it's it it uh, uh, replaces one one silicon then it